Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us on this Easter Sunday morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Again, thank you for joining us via Facebook or on our website. I would ask you to fill out one of these Connect cards, but since you're not here with us, we would still love to connect with you, though. We'd love to know your prayer requests that you have this week. And uh, I also wanted to let you know, this Wednesday, we're going to be starting our Wednesday night devotions. I don't know what time on Wednesday they're going to be coming out on Facebook, but I know that you want to turn in, uh, tune into that to pay attention to what's going on. Um, we'll have special messages every week through the rest of this quarantine time um, coming on Wednesdays. But we would love to have prayer requests. You can either put those in the comments on Facebook, you can email the staff, or you can call and leave us a message here at the church office. But thank you so much for joining us on this Easter Sunday morning. Would you go with the Lord in prayer with me now? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this glorious morning that we are able to gather together not necessarily in the church walls, but wherever we are, gathered around you and your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you so much that you overcome not only every day and every temptation that you had, that you, while well, you sent your son here on earth, but that you overcame the grave. Thank you so much for being victorious over death and rising to raise a new life again. Lord, I just ask that your blessings upon this service today and all of our members and community that are able to listen. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you have a copy of your worship guide this morning. Uh, if you do not, uh, you'll want to uh, make sure that you can get it as quickly as possible uh, and be able to join with us as we have our responsive reading this morning. Uh, I will say a line, and at the end I will say, and God's people say, and that's your cue to be able to respond. It begins by saying, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. The Lord is risen. And God's people said, he is risen indeed. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, death, is your sting? Death has been swallowed up in victory. And God's people said, Christ, Christ is risen indeed. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And God's people said, Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is risen. And God's people said, He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Power that's 
Our scripture reading comes from uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 44 through 46. Join with me as we read God's word together. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, thanks God. Let me remind you that you can still continue to give offering through online by mailing it in or bringing it by the office. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, a day where we can rejoice and know that your Son has arisen. Lord, we thank you for the life that he brought to us, the life that he gave as an example, Lord, and the life that he gave in order for us to have eternal life with you. Lord, we pray that as we bring our tithes into this building, Lord, that you bless those, that you're, they are used for your kingdom around the world and in this county. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice you gave through your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Continue our worship and song. I invite you to join with me as we sing in Christ alone. The words are in your worship now. Oh, 
Well, this is an Easter like no other that I have ever experienced. But there is one thing that is sure. We certainly know that even though we cannot gather together, that we are able to celebrate what Jesus has done for us when he rose from the grave. As we come this morning, I want to ask you to join with me as we pray. And particularly that we would be praying for some things that I think we all have on our hearts and minds today. First of all, I think it is important for us uh, to be continuing to pray uh, that this COVID virus would be something that quickly ends. Uh, the crisis that has been uh, brought about by it would be something that the Lord sees fit to uh, close uh, and to finish and that we would be able to say that uh, we are moving past where we have been and what we have been experiencing. That means we certainly want to be praying and asking that God would be with those who are our first responders, uh, that he is also with those who are in those necessary professions, making sure that they get to us the goods and the items and the services that we need, and also those that are in the medical profession, uh, not to exclude those that are our leaders. We want to be praying for all of those and praying that God would have his will and his way uh, during this time by strengthening them and allowing us to be able to move forward. But I also think it is important for us to be praying that God would use this time as a time of great awakening amongst his people. That we would use this time to reflect, to think, to consider how it is that we can have life that is full and free because of Jesus our Savior, that we can face all things, not with the confidence in medicine or the confidence in our leaders, but the confidence in Christ. I, I just encourage you to be praying that you would uh, be lifting up on high the greatest need that we have, which is certainly that this crisis would be one that would turn our hearts and minds back to Jesus Christ and that there would be a great revival and a great awakening in our country. And so I encourage you to pray with me with that in mind. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day and we are grateful that we can be able to worship together even though we cannot gather. And God, we are grateful that we have something to worship about, that there is a Savior who went to the cross for us that our sin debt might be forever forgiven and that we have been freed, Lord, from all of the chains of suffering that this life wants to bind us in. And, oh God, we are able to say that there is life that is everlasting because of what Jesus has done for us. Oh God, we thank you and we praise you that even as we come, separated by the distance between this place and our homes, that we are able to still worship Christ the Lord who is risen today. He is up from the grave, and in Him and Him alone can we trust. Thank you, Jesus, that we can worship you today. And Lord, we are thankful that you are greater than any virus that you are more powerful than any crisis and that you are able to have something good come out of even the worst of circumstances. And so, Lord, as we pray for our leaders, as we pray for our first responders, as we pray for those in essential businesses, as we lift up to you those that are in our medical profession, as we pray for those who are suffering with this disease, we pray with expectant and hopeful hearts that you, God, will do a great work in this time, in our country, and in our lives. And Lord... By praying that, we are asking that you would send a great awakening. That you would send a great revival in this land. That people, because of this pause, because of this interruption, because of this break in the normal providence of God, that we would look to you and see that you are a God who is worthy of worship that you are a Savior who is ready to save us and forgive us, that you are a Lord 
who is worthy of our service each and every day. Lord, let there be lives saved and souls converted forever from hell into heaven, from death into life, all because we had this season in 2020. God, we ask that you would even now stir in our own hearts as we turn our attention to your word. And we ask that you would have your will and your way in Jesus' name, amen. This series has been a series going through the last words of Jesus. And as we have, it is a time when we have been thinking about what a good death might actually be. Particularly as we consider a good death, that question has been a, a one that's hung over all of the messages that have been preached. But it also is a question that hangs over all of our lives. In our culture today, we seem to be allergic to the idea of death. Even its mention. We avoid discussing death and we use these beautiful euphemisms like passing on or dearly departed or resting in peace. And we refuse to meet with dying loved ones because we don't want to remember them that way. We want to think of them the way that they lived or the way that we were most comfortable seeing them. We keep our children from death as long as we possibly can because evidently they're not mature enough to face that essential fact of life. We take pains to make a casket look comfortable. We, we make the body look natural. And people come by and they say, oh, don't they look so good? Well, no, they don't. They're dead. But we don't like to think that. The whole affair is something that we don't want to have any interruption to our ordinary lives. In fact, we now postpone our funerals to the weekend so that we don't have to miss even a day of work. And if this COVID virus crisis has taught us anything, it teaches us that we'll do anything to avoid even an illness that might lead to death. We'll social distance. We'll put on crazy masks and gloves. We'll stockpile toilet paper. We'll do whatever it takes to make sure we don't have to come into contact with an illness or with death. But friends, is that really something that is good? Don't we tell the world when we are allergic to death that life is more important here and now than it is hereafter? Aren't we twisting the Scripture one like Philippians 1.21, making it say, for me to live is Christ, but there is no gain in death. Nietzsche, the famous atheist, said this of Christians in his day, and I believe he could say it in Christians of our day as well. I might believe in their Redeemer if they were to look a little more redeemed. Just think about that. I think about someone that is like Queen Elizabeth I of England. Not the current queen, but the first one of that name. Who was the defender of the faith, the title carried from Henry VIII. She, as she, she lay dying, was surrounded by her courtiers. She was in a lavish bed in all of the earthly comfort that was possible. There was no care that was denied to her. Yet at her last breath, they heard her say, Oh my God. God, it is over. I have come to the end of life. The end, the end. To only have one life and to have done with it. To have lived and loved and triumphed and now it is over. One may defy everything else, but this. It's safe to say, friends, that hers was not a good death, even with all of its comfort. But do not mistake this. Friends, we cannot, in actuality, avoid death. No matter how much we try, no matter how much we try to avoid it, no matter how much we try not to think about it, death is coming to all of us. Pastor Erwin Lutzer reports that a missionary he knew told him of a tribe in Africa that prays that they might have a good death. 
And by this they do not mean the avoidance of pain or dying with some form of dignity or passing away in their sleep by old age. Good deaths are ones where the family is gathered around and this loved one who is passing is able to share one last time how important it is to live a godly life and prepare for eternity. Just imagine, friends, if you were a part of that tribe. What would you say to your family, to your friends, to those that love you the most when your time came? Jesus' final word on the cross of Calvary is one that will help us to be able to know how to prepare for death and how, in a very curious way, to have a good death that proclaims resurrection life. If you have your Bibles open to Luke 23, you can briefly review with me and remember all of the things that Jesus has already spoken. Before noon, when we pick up in this passage, Jesus has already spoken pardon twice to individuals that were there at the cross. He began with a prayer of pardon to all of those that hung Him on the tree, including you and me. And then He went on to promise pardon to that thief that was on the cross who cried out to Him and asked that He be remembered. Jesus promised that He would be in paradise with Him that day. A pardon was granted. He also saw His mother and the Apostle John there with the others that were closest to Him. And Jesus spoke words of comfort he asked that they would care for one another as a mother and a son. And most especially as he was saying that, he was wanting them to experience the comfort and the reality that there was life after death. At this point that we are coming to in this passage, verse number 44, where it says that darkness covered the land, we know that Jesus already has spoken a word of assurance as He faced the cruel judgment for sin. And he quotes from Psalm 22 when he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And just before the events of this verse, when we look at verse number 45, it's right before that that Jesus would have spoken those two words we reflected on when we looked at them on Good Friday when he cried out, I thirst humbling himself so that the prophecy of God might be fulfilled and he would have the strength to continue so that he might say with a loud voice, it is finished, humbly submitting his work to God for approval. But now we've come to that final scene on the cross. And we might say, why on this great resurrection day, Pastor, do we look back at the death of Jesus we, why do we focus so much on the horrific events of that day when we should be celebrating a resurrection? Why did the cross become the symbol of Christianity and not the empty tomb? Well, these are good questions. But I want you to reflect with me for just a moment on what the empty tomb might mean. There were Jewish and Roman leaders in Jesus' day that wanted people to believe that that empty tomb meant that His disciples had come and stolen away His body. There are some in church history who have said that that empty tomb means that Jesus swooned or fainted. And He did so convincingly because He was put into the tomb. He was buried. A stone was rolled in front of Him. And the guard was set. And yet, in His fainted, weakened state, he somehow was able to roll the stone back away and to get past the guards. The 19th century liberal scholars wanted us to believe that the empty tomb was nothing more than a metaphor because it was something that taught us that we shouldn't focus on the real live Jesus, but on the Jesus that was in our hearts. Well, friends, we come back to the cross when we think about resurrection because it's here that we see the true meaning of the empty tomb. You see, Jesus' body was stolen away, but it was not by His followers. It was by His Father who resurrected it. He did walk out of that grave, but it was not in the same beaten, bloodied, frail body that might have swooned. No, it was through His resurrected body that He walked out of that grave. His death certainly is a metaphor, something with greater meaning than what we would just look at in the moment. But it is far more that this death is meaningful because we serve a real, resurrected, ascended, and glorified living Lord day by day. So His last words 
This risen Lord's last words are ones that teach us how to live and how to die so that our death can proclaim resurrection life. So let's note first that Jesus endured the darkness. Verse 44 tells us that it covered the entire land. Now, this is something that is important because we never, friends, have to endure that same kind of darkness again. We see in Luke's record that God supernaturally plunged the entire earth, the night side and the day side, into darkness. He stopped the sun from shining, is what verse 45 tells us. This darkness prophetically is a sign of God's judgment against sin. We see this over and over again in the Scripture. You can look in Isaiah. You can look in Jeremiah. You can look at Joel. You can look at Matthew 24. You can look at Revelation. And you will find over and over and over again that the darkness that comes is a sign that God is judging and punishing sin. For God to be a good judge, He certainly had to punish all sin. He couldn't ignore any. That would make Him a bad judge. And for God to be a good God, He must provide a way for sinners to be saved. So as Jesus hung upon the cross, He became both the just and the justifier, according to Romans 3.26. Jesus' death glorified God by showing His goodness as He paid humanity's sin debt before God. We also should note that Luke relates to us at the death of Jesus, God miraculously tore the veil of the temple from top to bottom three hours after the darkness had fell. When Jesus died, the veil of the temple was shorn. This would have occurred as the priests were gathering to prepare for the evening sacrifices, the rituals that would have been happening in the temple. So there were witnesses to that rip that happened and to what now was a, a space that was free of any separation or division. The veil was there and it hung as a way to signify that there was a separation between the holy place and the holy of holies, the place where God Himself was to be enthroned. So there was separation between where man would be and where God was. It was symbolic of the sin that is in each of our lives that keeps us in separation from God. In Herod's temple, this veil was rich and beautiful. It was made in Babylon. It was embroidered with blue and scarlet and purple. It was affixed with fine linen on top of it. The embroidery and the linen formed mystical signs of the zodiac so that when you looked at this veil, it was a beautiful picture of the night sky. And like a woven rug, it would have been thick and strong. And it was totally destroyed. By its being ripped in two. The veil that was a separation, a sign of the separation between God and man, was totally destroyed. It was useful no more. And even as the high priest could only enter into that place, that holy of holies, once a year to make atonement, now anyone could walk right in to the very presence of God. At the cross, Jesus glorified God by showing His goodness and paving the way for humanity to have an unencumbered fellowship with God. And this leads us to our very first point. If we really want a good death, then we should give our lives for God's glory and for others' good. Jesus' death mattered because He gave His life for something that mattered eternally. Yes, Jesus gave Himself into the hands of cruel men. He prophesied that with His disciples. Even after they confessed Him as Lord, He said, but wait, you don't know all yet because I'm going to Jerusalem and I will be handed over to cruel men. Jesus gave Himself into suffering and to judgment. But friends, Jesus' resurrection is so important because it proves that His death was not in vain. His gift was appreciated. It was effective for us. So let me ask you, to what do you give your life? Do you remember those words of Nietzsche? I might trust their Redeemer if they looked a little more redeemed. Can others look at our lives and tell that we are truly redeemed? Perhaps 
If we were not believers, we would look at the way Christians live and and understand better their reluctance to trust a Savior who leaves so little impact on the people of this day. We get upset when our needs are not met and we look for other churches. We beg people to volunteer and we don't have even those that are confident enough to stand to read Scripture or to pray to the God they say they love. We act like serving Jesus is a chore rather than a privilege. Are we really people that look redeemed? Are the days gone, friend, when Christians would understand the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer who died in Nazi Germany for opposing Hitler? He famously said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. The only man, excuse me, only the man who is dead to his own will can follow Christ. Friends, we will truly not appreciate an empty tomb until we have first appreciated the clarion call of the cross, which is die to self, live for God. Do you hear that call today? Do we hear that call today? We must change. Let me ask you, in our lives, what is it that must change that we can answer that call? Might I suggest to you that the answer is found in Jesus' final word from the cross? You can read it there in verse number 46 where it says, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. There is so much to understand in just these few words. Time would would be so scarce to actually go through them and, and give them what they deserve, but let me attempt to just give you a picture of what we need to understand. We cannot ignore that Jesus, summoning every last ounce of strength, shouted these words. It was a loud voice. Jesus' joy in the renewed relationship with God could not be uttered in a whimper. Jesus wanted to be able to shout this so that everyone could hear and understand that there is a way for a relationship with God to be renewed. We cannot ignore that Jesus here again quotes from Scripture. Even though He was totally at His weakest in His body, in His human frailty, His mind was laser focused on the Word of God and He now quotes from Psalm 31.5 knowing that it is His God alone who can deliver Him. The text of this psalm was part of the evening prayers for a Jew. It would be prayed as a comfort for those that would be getting ready to go to sleep and be defenseless against whatever might come. It is something like what we would pray with our children. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. This was the prayer of the Jew. And yet we must note the difference that would happen with Jesus here from all of the other generations of Jews that would pray this, Jesus can say that truly God is His Father. Jesus can say that He is not speaking just of a death that might occur, but a death that is certain to occur. And Jesus can say that yes, He has had victory over the conflict that is only supposed in this passage. And friends, we cannot ignore that Jesus fulfills this Scripture by giving Himself into the care of His Father's hands. He is praying to God as His Father. As His Father. Don't mistake this. He has a restored relationship. No longer does He say, My God, My God. No, now He says, My Father. Jesus here is addressing His final words to His Father, praying that God would keep Him safe in His hands. And remember, Jesus is the one in John 10 who said that there is not a single one who has been given into the Father's hand who would ever be lost. He knows that His work is finished, His relationship with the Father is restored, and His fellowship is eternal. And because of all of this, we may have a relationship with God who is our Father if we would turn to Jesus Christ. But note, and this is important, Jesus didn't commit His body to the Father. The word that we see there, that word commit, is one that could be translated as deposit. This should bring to mind what we do when we go to a bank and deposit money. We expect that it will be protected. We expect that it will be preserved. We expect even perhaps that it might be increased by interest. But this is not what Jesus was wanting for His body. 
He didn't want this broken, frail human body marred with sin to be protected, preserved, or even increased. No, he wanted that body to be transformed and renewed. So what does he do but commit his spirit, that part that will never ever change that part of us that really is us the one the, the one that makes us who we are the eternal part of us that's what he commits to the father and when we read in scripture in hebrews 9 27 that there is once for man to die and then the judgment it is that spirit that god judges in the moment of our death either to heaven or to hell and so what Jesus does when he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, is say, I trust, Lord, that you are going to deliver me into eternal life. This is what Jesus tells us. This is what he tells us all. That at death, if we really want our death to be good, we should give our whole future into the care of our Heavenly Father. Far different than avoiding death, we should proclaim with Jesus with confidence and loudly confess that we are being cared for by our Father eternally. John Huss, who was an early martyr of the Reformation, was burned at the stake in 1415. He refused to recant his belief in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone is revealed in the Scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. And he was condemned by men. The Catholic bishop who lit the fires to burn him said, Now we commit your soul to the devil, but with a loud voice, perhaps inspired by generations of martyrs, stretching all the way back to Stephen, he chose to reflect the words of Jesus at his death. And he said, I commit my spirit into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unto thee I commend my spirit from which thou hast redeemed. Friends, our lives matter and our deaths matter only if we give ourselves into the care of a Father who has redeemed us because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. But are we so timid that we can't even go outside of our houses and share that with our neighbors? Are we so timid that we can't even whisper that to our families? Are we no longer the people that would go from door to door, house to house, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, that there is life for all those who would trust in Him? You see, the final verses of our passage today tell us that there are three ways to respond to Jesus' death. We can first respond like that centurion. It is an educated response that he offers. He praises God because of what has happened in Jesus. He, he sees all of the things that have happened and he understands that it's important. But note, we don't read that the centurion is saved. Tradition tells us that the centurion was Longinus and he did become a believer. But in that moment, he was but a momentary celebrator of Christ. After all, the centurion had a job to do. He had two other criminals to crucify. And he continued forward after he uttered these words of praise. We also see the response of the crowds. They left and they were so emotionally moved. They had come for a show as evidenced by the word that is used in the original language. It, it is a word that is there and it's the only place in Scripture that we find the word theater. They came for a show, but they leave like the tax collector, beating their breasts. They're emotionally moved and they're broken, saying, it's us. We're the ones who made him go through this. We're the ones who cried crucify. We don't hear that any of them were saved. No doubt many of them would have heard Peter's sermon on Pentecost and become a part of the early church, but that day, they're nothing more than an emotional wreck. We see the response of his followers. Unlike the crowds or the centurion, Jesus' followers continued to follow him. They stood at a distance, expectantly waiting for what would happen. They stood there watching as they pierced his side and blood and water flowed out. They saw him take down, taken down off of the cross. They saw Joseph carry him into a borrowed tomb. They were expectantly hoping for something more to happen. But scripture doesn't tell us in that moment that anything else happened for them. 
Friends, we have to respond to Jesus' death and to Jesus' sacrifice. But there's really only one way that responds in a, in, a, in a fashion that truly shows we believe in the resurrection. It's giving ourselves fully to the Lord. Every part of us. We, we give Him all of our education. We give Him all of our emotions. We give Him all of what we expect. And when we do that, when we fully give ourselves to Jesus Christ, that's when we can have a vibrant relationship with the risen Savior forever and ever and ever. So today, I wonder if you would say, into your hands I commit my spirit. You see, that is the cry of a believer's heart. It is what a profession of faith is all about. And friends, that is what I hope and pray that you will do this Resurrection Sunday in Jesus' name. Pray with me if you will. Lord, we understand and we know that this is a day of great celebration. But it is a day of celebration because there was a great sacrifice that was received, approved, and forever placed in front of us when you rose Jesus from the grave. Our sin has been paid for. It has been paid for in full. Our lives have been redeemed from the prison of suffering that we were in. Our eternity has been transformed from torturous hell to heavenly bliss. God, there is nothing that is more magnificent than what you did when you went to the cross and when you rose from the grave. But, O oh Lord, you did all of that to teach us how to face what we all will face if we live to our death. You teach us to give ourselves to you fully and wholly. Every part of us all that we have. And so God, it is our prayer today that you would help us to be willing to give to you freely and fully all of who we are. Perhaps there are those who need to make it known today that they have trusted in Jesus, that they have given themselves to him. There are opportunities, Lord, to call in, to email, to get in touch with those that are at this church, and we pray that people will take advantage. Perhaps there are those that are saying, I'm that one that needs to be revived. I'm that one that needs to rededicate my life. There are opportunities by dialing a telephone number or sending an email to make that known, and we ask God that you would allow that to happen today. Lord, in all of these things, we come and we humbly ask that you would help us to seek Jesus as our Savior and to serve Christ as our Lord and as we go about to share Christian love. And we ask that you would help us to go now in the grace and the peace of our great Savior and Lord. Amen.